Okay, so welcome back everybody from the lunch. Uh, next, uh, next talk in schedule is from Alex Martelli. There will be bugs. Um, Alex uh, has been an associate of Python Italia Association since, since the first early days and, is, um, and has been a speaker uh, since the very first edition of our Python Italia uh, conference. I would like to welcome him, uh, not just for his uh, uh, outstanding technical skills, but also for his uh, uh, polyhedrical and uh, um, um, personality and, and interests. And uh, I also mentioned that uh, uh, Alex is a um, very important person in the uh, Python community uh, as uh, um, due to, to his very important contributions uh, during his, uh, in his job at, at Google. So welcome Alex, there will be bugs. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I realized it was a rich lunch, so I'll try to keep us all awake. Uh, so, this is the answer to what question? Well, to this question. Will there be bugs is a typical question of the probably not explored, but uh, the inexperienced programmer wonders as uh, they code. And the answer is yes, there will be. The probability is zero, followed by at least four nines. So it's, I think eight is more likely. Uh, Murphy's Law applies in its powerful form. Murphy's Law is if anything can go wrong, it will. Uh, the powerful form, if nothing can go wrong, it will go wrong anyway. Uh, this, by the way, the image is uh, Counter Admiral Grace Murray Hopper uh, page from the diaries of one of the early electronic computers where she taped a moth that had a short circuit, short circuited one of the valves, I believe, uh, identifying it as the first case of bug actually being found. The term bug was common in electrical engineering, uh, but uh, this was a physical bug, so a triumph, a relay, actually a relay, so it wasn't electronics really, it was an electromechanical computing back in the 40s. So, the, this could finish the talk, since I've already asked the question and answered it, but uh, uh, I'll just uh, proceed with more questions. Okay, so there will be bugs. Where? When, when will there be bugs? Well, if you're pushing the envelope either of the art of computing or of your own personal skill, doing something that's either completely new or at least new to you, there will be traps you've never encountered before waiting for you, so there will be bugs. On the other hand, if you're doing routine maintenance, something you've done a thousand times before, uh, you're supposed to know all the traps waiting, but it's impossible, due to the way the human brain works, to keep your attention on uh, your routine task at 100%. You will have attention lapses. By the way, I strongly recommend tomorrow you catch my wife Anna's uh, uh, talk about how your brain tricks you because that's a, a great compliment and actually even more useful than the, my more technically focused talk. So uh, there will be bugs when you're pushing the envelope, there will be bugs when you're working well within your existing experience and capability, and in all cases in between. So that's uh, uh, because of a mix of the two factors. Uh, actually, I did mention the probability is zero followed by a lot of nines, so not a one. 0 because I did have an exception in my life. My very first program in 1974 uh, for first year uh, hardware major in electronic engineering, Bridge Enthusiast, which was a key, decided since a very nice assistant was willing to give us one uh, set of punched cards uh, with the secret codes to run on the mainframe, to do a programming, uh, our first program in our lives uh, to compute the conditional probabilities of suit division in contract bridge. Uh, 
we had no programming courses, which was absolutely no problem because when we finally did get a programming courses, all they were doing was essentially teaching us a subset of the Fortran reference manual, which we had memorized as part of this exercise. And they didn't teach us anything about testing or debugging. The words weren't even mentioned in a full year course. And we were humble. Why? Because there was a mystique uh, around the big brain, the uh, mainframe computer we were using. You couldn't, uh, humble mortals like us couldn't even be allowed to actually look at the machine. It was sealed off in a temperature controlled room. We could just go to a counter where uh, a white frocked attendant would take our punched cards and pro march away mysteriously to do some incantation uh, to propitiate uh, the machine. Uh, that actually helped. Being humble is a great attitude. It's uh, kind of hard to cultivate when a computer is, you know, something you can easily toss if you're angry 30 feet away from you. Uh, and I doubt very much we can reconstruct the mystique of the mainframe. I mean, the cloud is even further away than the mainframe was, but you know what? It's too accessible. That's the problem. You, like, you know how to get there and you can run a thousand times. So the attitude is very much like when you're programming on your personal computer. So we were using punched cards and without ever having been instructed, even Having heard of it, we kind of reinvented code reviews because all three of us were perched on the, the one guy who was typing the things and ready to catch any mistype because we knew a single typo would run our only chance to get to this set of computations. It was kind of like a pair programming times one and a half because there were actually three of us. Uh, by the way, when we finally did get PCs, not many years later, bugs abounded because the uh, attitude was obviously much more pr practical, like try and try again. Uh, so I did get a bug-free program in my life, never again. Uh, but since it has been exactly 40 years, I kind of hope the rhythm is one every 40 years, so I'm due for another bug-free program this year, can't wait. It would be a great experience. So, 40 years later, a uh, big problem that uh, existed then has no reason to exist now. We could only do one run, so even if we had known about testing, which we didn't, we wouldn't have any chance to do any. Nowadays, obviously, tests must be at the heart of your whole software development experience to avoid bugs, discover them, and fix them once you've discovered them. That should have been true in the 70s, too. Donald Knuth, one of the legends, still living legend, of programming, uh, sent a copy of an algorithm he had just invented to another couple of luminaries with a handwritten note, beware of bugs in the above code. I have demonstrated it is correct, but I have not tested it. So he had his heart in the right place. Mathematical proof that a program is correct is nice, but there is no substitute for tests. Nevertheless, those two techniques we independently developed code reviews and pair programming still help, and we'll see how. Uh, where do bugs like to hide? Actually, anywhere, but let's focus on the most likely spots. It has to be anywhere. Think about it. If you knew that, for example, all bugs uh, resided on odd number pages of your code printout, you would dedicate all of your attention to the odd numbered pages. So, of course, the wily bugs would start hiding on the even one. <laughs> so there's no winning it. You have to be aware they can be anywhere. Still, there are several more vulnerable spots in your code. Anywhere you're doing advanced stuff. Uh, what's advanced stuff? Well, it depends on you. Uh, I imagine that for some people, not including me, a meta class, uh, which in turn uses its own meta meta class, uh, is run of the mill. They do three before breakfast. For me, it's very advanced stuff. So if I ever used something that weird, 
I would suspect a lot of bugs there. For somebody else, uh, something that for me has become reasonably normal, like, uh, I don't know, a generator accepting a, a send and so on, can be very advanced, so uh, it could be a bug hiding place. But even more than advanced, technically advanced stuff, whenever you're being clever, whenever you think, oh, that's cool, I'm, I get to cut a corner and do things slightly faster, that's most likely to be a place where bugs will love to hide. So first of all, simplify. Keep your code as simple as you can and still get the job done. And unit test will, I'll, I'll be boring you with this refrain because while they're not a panacea, they can never show the absence of bugs, they're really indispensable to show the presence of bugs every time you code. Um, there will be places uh, where you don't fully understand something. Maybe uh, you're really experienced at uh, your language, platform, architecture, but you're solving a problem for somebody else, either informally or, or on the job, and it may be that the problem is not fully understood, at least not by you, possibly not even by the person posing it, uh, because the communication, especially if, you're, uh, if your intended end user is not a programmer, is often a bit ambiguous, a bit uncertain. So where there are such misunderstandings, bugs will hide. A bug doesn't necessarily mean your program is gonna crash, uh, it may mean it computes something that looks good, but is not the answer to the actual problem. So for that, to debug that kind of thing, acceptance tests, which ideally would mean tests run by the person or, or firm who intends to use the software as opposed to the person or, or firm who has developed the software would be the great solution if you're lucky enough to have uh, this uh, be able to happen. Uh, also, code reviews uh, by, at least if your code is very readable, which I hope it is, thanks to the simplify motto, uh, somebody, Python is very readable. It's uh, executable pseudocode. You can, if you have the right users, uh, have your users participate in code, in reviewing your code. They may be able to spot something that looks like you're solving a different problem. You're solving something, but it's not what they need solved. So try to see if you can arrange that. <coughs> uh, very fertile place for bugs to hide is repeated code, especially so-called copied and pasted code. It's so convenient with modern editors. Uh, uh, why should I bother having a function or something? This stuff is just about right, so I copy it there, I pass it here, I edit a bit, and there, I'm solved. So soon you have six or seven copies of this snippet with slight variations, and then something happens, because things are changing all the time, you need a little change, and you remember two of the places, and you fix those, and then there's another four or five around which are not fixed, and next time they run, you'll get the wrong result. Uh, dry, don't repeat yourself, is absolutely the mantra there. Uh, and then there's rarely executed code. You can't avoid that. Maybe there's some place in your code that only triggered if the computer catches fire. How are you gonna test that? Uh, take a lighter and some gasoline and does your computer and see, it's a bit costly. Uh, what, uh, I guess you could do that once or twice, but it's uh, slow and not automated and, and, and costly, even with cheap computers, if you do it often. So what you absolutely need here, maybe in other places, but definitely when you're testing error handling and other stuff that uh, like gets executed very rarely, you need to be able to simulate the actual system that could provoke the error and make believe the error has happened so your error, uh, checking error handling code will trigger. Uh, and the method to fake things up, there are several, but the most popular one is known as mocking and we'll see it very briefly as part of this. Finally, and curiously, code that used to have bugs, you fix the bugs, it's 
incredibly likely that the bugs, the, the bugs were happy there. They had a good living. So you've chased them out. Unless you take specific precaution, and we'll see what I mean by that, they will return. They like it there. They, they, it, it happens so often, there's even a term for that, regressions, which is the return of the bug to the place where it used to be. So those are the vulnerable places, and these are the fixes. Simplify. As Kernighan put it, debugging is twice as hard as writing a program in the first place. If you are as clever as you possibly can when you're writing, you don't have enough brain to debug it. So don't use more than half your brain when writing code, so you will have the margin of safety to be able to fight the bugs that hide there. A typical example, it doesn't seem like an expression, simply doing some arithmetic computation, can be all that complicated, but it can. Uh, if your expression is more than, I don't know, rule of thumb, four, five operators, unless it's very repetitive, A plus B plus C plus D plus, that, that's okay. It's uh, boring but simple. But if you have different operators mixed, uh, you may get priority wrong, your parentheses may be wrong, there may be a wrong operator somewhere, it's hard to test because it does one big, uh, maybe on six different variables, six different terms, break it up. Break it up into expressions with no more than three or maybe four operators. <coughs> Give a name to the temporary result that denotes what it is they do. Uh, what, what does this uh, result mean? The name may be artificial. For example, if you have a, uh, the, the formula for solving a second degree equation, uh, the b squared minus 4ac part is known as a delta. So that's one way of uh, naming it, it's fine. It doesn't mean anything, but it's conventional notation in elementary algebra, so use that. Or something related to the semantics of what you're computing, that's great too. Uh, an even harder problem is when it's not an expression, but a decision chain, and beware of operators that act as a decision chain. So, end or and the ternary operator if then, those, uh, sorry, if else, those are uh, conjoined both of the issues. They both help you make a very complicated expression and are hiding uh, what would normally be expressed as if else chains or trees, uh, if else, if else. Again, try to break them up. Breaking up uh, an expression per se is trivial. You can do it in line and it will be fast and so on. Breaking up a complex decision chain, especially if it includes nested loops or recursion, you will need to write auxiliary functions for that, which unfortunately do slow things down a bit. But it's worth it because you can test so much better these small units than you can anything big and complicated and avoid missing things. And uh, I recommend kind on a sideline later, uh, use coverage or, or fig leaf, which is an alternative to coverage, to find out uh, exactly what parts of your code your tests have exercised. It's whenever there is a complex decision chain, you want to make sure every bit has been tested. It's very easy to fall in the crack. Uh, for loops, uh, this particularly applies, of course, if you have conditional break and continuous statements. Note, this is not a warning to avoid them. Sometimes uh, they are the clearest way to express what you want to do. It just requires care. And another thing I'm not advocating avoiding, because it's way simpler than writing your own parser, every time you must uh, extract information for, from a string, is regular expressions. They're very powerful, but very tricky. Uh, again, it's about being complicated. Uh, again, you can't necessarily avoid it, but be sure to test them very thoroughly. I recommend, uh, there are several sites, this is one I like. Uh, it lets you test 
uh, regular expression by typing in the regular expression and a string on which it gets applied. It's not automated, but it's a first step before you write your automated test, making sure your regular expression is identifying the right bit of the input string. And it allows, um, the specific reason I recommend it, it allows uh, uh, you to test regular expression in different languages because there are tiny but important differences between regular expression in Python versus regular expression in JavaScript and so on. So you want to test them thoroughly. Also, in programming, don't repeat yourself. You may notice I repeat myself a lot, but that's a part of the mantra of the good presenter. First, tell them what you'll tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you've told them. That's uh, the way, as uh, my psychologist uh, wife will confirm, to get through and hope to stay in listeners' minds. But in programming, Hunt and Thomas expressed a very ambitious goal, not only connected to code, to have every piece of knowledge represented only once in an ambiguous and authoritative way. Uh, that is iffy because you may need to do some code generation based on that single representation. So I'm not necessarily a, an advocate of that, although the acronym DRY is irresistible, so people use it to mean what's actually the once and only once pattern, which specifically refers to code. Any operational snippet must appear once and only once. Well, it must appear once if it's used in the program, of course. But the point is it must not appear repeatedly. Copy and paste code is the worst of code smell. The concept of code smell um, was originally formulated by the extreme programming practitioners, but it applies to any kind of programming. There is code that you look at and say, this isn't right. There's something rotten here. It smells. So fix it. Uh, why is duplicate code bad? Because things change, as I mentioned, and you will not fix all the duplicates. So my motto is, uh, kind of too highfalutin to be a good soundbite, abstract what there is, merge what doesn't. And let me give an example. By the way, if you don't respect dry, you get wet, which stands for we enjoy typing. <laughs> Well, it doesn't really, but we, we all had to, to find an alternative to dry. So suppose that in two different parts of your program, you have these snippets. Looks pretty innocuous, right? Wrong. It's, uh, it smells. Can't you? Yeah, I, I, I think I feel the smell. So let's dry it up. We extract a function which takes as parameters, it needs to abstract them parameters because in one case it's bar bus, in another it zips up, and in one case something gets added, in another doesn't, it does the test and uses a relatively simple, this is about as complicated as an expression should get. If C is none, nothing to add, so just B, otherwise add and the two repeated snippets become single liners. For rarely executed code, uh, you need to make believe that uh, the computer is burning or something like that. Uh, I would strongly recommend uh, using the unit test.mock module. <coughs> That's in the standard library since 3.3, uh, but there are backports for everything, including to to seven for sure, I think to six as well. And specifically, you can use it in a thousand ways. I strongly recommend the with statement use because it patches a mock in lieu of something real only for that little scope within the with statement. And then automatically, when the with statement finishes, it places the real thing back. So this way you don't risk mocking uh, something uh, elsewhere when you only wanted to simulate it there and use the real thing elsewhere. Uh, so it's strongly recommended. Once you have the mock object, which I've called X here, you can do a lot of things with it. 
You can set its return value, meaning if it called, this is what it returns. You can set a side effect, which can be an exception it raises. It can be very things, but can be an exception it raises. Uh, you can assert it's been called or it's not been called or it's been called with certain parameters. Be very careful when you use mock. Uh, if you access any attribute or method, say, say with a misspell, it will appear automatically. You typically need to pay a lot of care for that and I strongly recommend using the auto spec which tells mock simulate closely the thing you're replacing so you must have the same attributes and method and not even more that's my recommendation so here's an example so the purpose of foo is calling a function which never fails well hardly ever uh, because it should never fail then there would be no need for foo what foo does is wrap the uh, never fails call in a try except, so if the uh, very rare exception, oops, it did, happens, then it goes in as a warning in the logs before being erased. So the logs have a trace that this rare event has actually occurred. Now, do you see the problem with this code? Anybody? Yeah, you don't count. You probably, <laughs> you probably saw. There's a tiny almost invisible typo. It's not spelled warm, as in uh, lukewarm and nice temperature. It's spelled worn with an N, as in alert. Uh, if this ever occurs, uh, then when in the error handling code, which hardly ever executes, the lookup of warm will fail, and instead of raising the original error, it will propagate an attribute error, which you will be held to debug. So, how do you avoid the error, the bug, cozily hiding in the rarely executed code uh, that uh, you use for, for handling very rare errors? You test it. You mock patch the function never fails, a footnote because I didn't have space on the slide, be sure here to add at the very least auto spec equal true and other things. Study the mock documentation is very good. Uh, you set the side effect to the specific exception it needs to raise and the self assert raises says this will raise an oops it did when you're calling foo. Uh, you will have this test fail because it actually raises an attribute error and you will easily debug it. Okay, so that's the when and the where and now we come to the why and uh, there are a few other W words you're taught to always ask in journalism class but uh, this is where we end. Uh, why? Well, because of your brain. Again, I recommend Anna Stoke tomorrow. Uh, I'm only briefly touching on perception appears to us to be the simplest of things. Like where our thoughts begin uh, is on the data from perception. Well, it's not that way. Perception involves a lot of processing uh, and often you end up seeing what you expect to see. So you expect to see correct code, you see the code is correct, even though it's really buggy. Uh, attention lapses, especially when you're doing a routine task. Overconfidence, you trust yourself too much, you're not humble. Um, confirmation bias, you like much better to hear what you already knew were true, was true, rather than getting information that means that something you thought you knew is false, and so on and so forth. A uh, typical example, you've written it, it's your code, it's your baby, you're proud of it. Now this is a place where bugs love to hide. You will not see the bugs in code you're proud of because, sorry for the Italian expression, but I don't think I can translate it, but essentially any code show is beautiful to his mom. It's mom. It's true. It's not actually Italian, it's more Neapolitan uh, mix, but it's true. So how do you fix that? Uh, 
well, what a, a brain transplant might work, but I'm not sure where you'd get a non-human brain to, to replace yours. So, so that's left as a subject for, for future research. Uh, you need egoless programming. We'll see what that means. You need more eyeballs. You need not to be the only one looking at that code. You need testing and you need some static analysis. Every little bit helps. It's better to take multiple precautions than to fail to take some. Egoless programming was first described by Weinberg in 71 in his immortal masterpiece, The Psychology of Computer Programming. People get a bit look at me weird when I recommend as possibly the single most important books on programming you will ever read, something that's 43 years old. But you know what? What it is about programming, uh, it's mostly about humans. And uh, differently from all of our programming languages and computer, humans have not been upgraded yet. We're still in 1.0 beta. So the same issues that uh, Weinberg identified in the 60s and wrote up in the early 70s still apply to us. And uh, the um, Egoless programming in particular is uh, coded into our uh, Ten Commandments, of which I, I only uh, bring up the three most important ones. Understand and accept that you will make mistakes. Don't start with the hypothesis, well, maybe this is the one uh, bugless program in my life. It's possible, but it's so unlikely. It's better to accept there are mistakes and focus on find them early. The later you find them, the worse off you are, the higher your cost. Uh, you are not your code. Criticism of the code doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means this is bad code and you can make it better. It's much easier to make better code than you make yourself a better person. And vice versa, this is the, when you're critiquing somebody else's work product, critique the code, never the person. But that doesn't only apply to programming, by the way. It's a great idea in life. Your uh, friend of yours is uh, trying cooking a new dish. You ask you to taste it. You say, you put far too much salt in it. That's a fair criticism, but think how much better it works if it was, this has too much salt. Then you're not critiquing the cook you're critiquing the dish. It's more objective if they, it makes it easier for the cook to accept the, they are not their dish. They are not the dish they've cooked. And that exact same mechanics applies to code. So this isn't some funky new age Zen thing. It's very practical life advice, especially but not exclusively in programming. Open source means your code is published out there. Everybody can look at it. It can help. Um, Eric Raymond was very, is, to this day, very optimistic on that. He claims that Linus Law is given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, and then goes into very precise. But this is how everybody knows it. I, I had to look this up. Nobody knows it by heart. Uh, Glass, in an otherwise interesting book, well, or generally interesting book, claims it's one of the fallacies of software engineering because the rate at which additional bugs are uncovered does not scale linearly. I think they're talking at cross purposes here because nothing here says it's linear. Nothing says 10 times more developers means 10 times less bugs. It's quite likely there's a Diminish, a curve of diminishing return. Two is much better than one, three is better than two, four is a bit better, and so on, not linearly. But that's okay, as long as it's monotonously increasing. However, the very fact, the simple fact that your code is available for anybody's inspection doesn't actually mean that your beta tester and co-developers will bother to look. Unfortunately, we had two very recent events, both uh, huge security breaches, uh, bringing this uh, to everybody's attention very sharply. The uh, go-to-fail bug, a uh, simple duplicated line, uh, 
the is if some blah blah go to fail go to fail the second one is unconditional so all the following tests are never run that was in a uh, apple written but open sourced piece of code and the heart bleed which affected uh, the uh, open ssl almost universally used open ssl library by allowing uh, potential hackers to steal tens of thousands of bytes of random pieces of memory which could have unclear user IDs and passwords. I strongly recommend Mike Bland's article on martinfowler.com. Uh, Mike's an ex-colleague of mine. He dropped out, well, he claims he dropped out of programming to become a full-time uh, musician, professional musician. He's, uh, learning is getting a doctorate in music at Berkeley and things but obviously he was interested he still got the uh, programming bug another sense of the word bug enough to have written this wonderful series of articles on how a testing culture is no sound is indispensable you can and now he's trying to mount an new effort within the OpenSSL community to make sure a testing culture goes in place. Another way to get more than one pair of eyeballs on your software is pair programming. Two people sitting at the same computer programming at the same time. Or uh, possibly it can be done remotely with uh, uh, screen sharing. I'm most familiar with things done in person. Uh, and there's two roles, the guy or gal uh, at the keyboard, who's the driver, uh, focuses on the tactical aspects of completing the current class or function or module. The observer reviews and comments as they go, keeps in mind the bigger picture, uh, does safety net uh, for any typos and so on. It's important to switch roles frequently. Don't let one person do a couple of hours of driving uh, and the other one a couple of hours of, of observing switch every 20 30 minutes when not not on a alarm clock when you're at a good stopping point end of a function end of a class end of a test there are many empirical studies uh, and meta research on them uh, that all confirm higher quality uh, results uh, and faster time to completion and mostly claim there's a larger total effort that is uh, total hours spent by all the programmers involved compared with solo programmer. I think this last bit has a high bias because it doesn't count the fact that so if the uh, pair program code is higher quality has fewer bugs so there will be fewer bugs to fix and we know that fixing bugs is costlier and slower the further on in the future they're discovered plus pair programming produces a higher bus number the bus concept of bus number as pressed a bit specifically is how many people in a project would be uh, need to be run over by a bus to bring the project to a complete halt now the solution could be thought of, okay, let's give uh, the driver of buses uh, more uh, security uh, training, but it doesn't really only refer to bugs. Say there's a flu epidemic, how many uh, programmers in the team need to be floor, like out with the flu for a few days and everybody else can do anything because everything is blocked. Uh, the point is that only a few people are familiar with this bit of code. Uh, if they're all out for some reason or other, nobody else knows where to go. So it's important that any subset can keep doing a little progress so everybody should be at least a little familiar. And that normally requires a lot of uh, study and analysis on the part of the people who haven't worked on a bit of software. But if if there's pair programming with continuous switching of pair, everybody will gain some familiarity all around. Last but not least, there's a more eyeballs approach known as code reviews. They got a bad rap back, back in the 60s uh, when IBM experts Fagan invented Fagan inspections, which are very high ceremony, uh, things uh, with multiple meetings, uh, everybody has printed code, highlighters, uh, go over the, the code line by line, blah, blah, blah. 
it's really slow, really high cost. It's also really very effective. It was used extensively as part of the Apollo missions that eventually landed a man on the moon. There, it has defects. You may fail. You're focusing too much on the detail. It can be hard to get the big picture. And sometimes people get hung up about some absolutely trivial, oh, this brace should be on the same line. No, no, no. Of course, the brace should break on its own line, and you can waste an hour of completely useless stuff. Um, actually, nowadays, what code reviews mean is much <coughs> faster and informal and lightweight walkthroughs and critiques of code that almost are as effective and much faster if you use the right tools. Remember, they're a great complement, not an alternative, to pair programming and testing. Don't say, oh, I don't need code reviews, I do pair programming. Doesn't work that way, because the pair in, in pair programming gets synced up, and it's very easy that they end up making the same mistake because they reason about it together. Uh, you need somebody who was not involved directly in writing the code to review it for real effectiveness. And finally, by far the most important thing is testing. As Django called or Jacob Kaplan must put it, code without test is broken by design. And by test, I do not mean, not, neither does Jacob, uh, just run it and see what happens. Those are a waste of time, especially if the guy, the person running them and seeing what happened is the same person who wrote the code in the first place. Uh, the same misunderstandings and so on will be replicated exactly. What you want is automated lightweight unit tests. What, lightweight, they must be fast, so you just keep running them. Uh, and they can make any single unit pretty close to perfect, and then you need integration tests. How do the units work together in, in a program of any complexity? That's, again, complementary, not alternative. You want each unit to be well tested with very fast code, and the interaction between units, the integration, to be between subsystems. Uh, in a sufficiently heavy, rich thing, you may need a heavyweight acceptance test or quality assurance. That unfortunately means, again, humans looking in this case, and probably not at the code that it screens to see it works as intended. Uh, that's a bit outside the scope because I'm really looking at getting code out that will uh, be perfect if it actually solving the right problem, and this can really only be verified. So is testing or eyeballs more important? Both. Testing is a way to objectively show there are bugs. You can't prove there aren't. They're automated, so at no cost, essentially, you're running. Eyeballs uh, can pick up some issues like this code is too complicated, this code is not clear, this name is misleading. A test will never get that. Uh, however, they're not automated, so human beings are actually spending hours there. You can't repeat them all the time. So you need both for complementing. And for the stool of anti-bug, you also want lint, which is automated, just like the test. It catches, uh, heuristically, some stuff that you don't really want in your code, and it helps make your code uniform. If the code is uniform, like where do lines break, uh, how many spaces, and so on, is all automated uh, by your lint, then when you do the review, it will be more productive because it will not focus on the bike shedding issues of do you need a space here or do you need two spaces? It doesn't matter. So let's focus on the important thing. These are the tools you will use uh, against bugs. First, source code control. Don't really care what. I personally prefer Mercurial, but the others are great too. Uh, just beware not to use all of its power, as we'll repeat later. Then you need a testing framework. I recommend unit test to the standard library, a bug tracker, and a code review tool. I don't, I don't really have any recommendation on these because they need to be integrated with your source code control so they can, ideally they should be, I think, <coughs> online web apps. Now, some people may have noticed a glaring absence here. What tool that everybody ties in with fighting bugs have I not even mentioned? 
Hmm? Exactly. A debugger is not a good tool for fighting bugs. It's mild importance because the point is that a debugger is for like following your code step by step. If it's so complicated that you need to go along it step by step, don't play out <laughs> with it, the debugger. Simplify the code so it's obviously correct. <laughs> you don't need a debugger anymore. It can still help you learn, but that's not about fighting bugs. Um, beware the geek's normal and natural uh, love for tools. It's uh, normal to think if I have very powerful weapons, so I'll frighten the bugs, they'll run away. Uh -uh. They're very courageous little beasts. At best, uh, the tools will help, they will not solve your problems, and they can hurt by distracting you. You can spend hours yak shaving, that's a uh, kind of weird idiom, uh, like for example, following through code that works perfectly well. Uh, much more important, the tool details are the thing I've been focusing throughout. Attitude, skill, care, and focus. And good practice, like process, that's a broader subject. It is perfectly natural to think that tools are cool, just beware their power can hurt you. For example, some people, when I say the bugger isn't really helpful, well, but I need to interact, iteratively examine all the values of my variable uh, manually, every time, why don't you just log them? You know, that's what logging is for. Uh, specifically, logging debug, so when you're running in a debugging mode, you, you get it, when you're uh, in a hurry, you don't. And then you write a script that sanity checks the variables are, the values are what, to, and the difference is it's automated. You spend a couple hours the first time writing the script, and then it's like that. It happens in the background. You don't have to waste your life in front of a flipping debugger. A source code control, some people say, oh, you use Mercurial. I use Git. It lets me do 10 times more complicated things. Well, if anything, to me they say, that's a great reason not to use it. Because uh, they're introducing bugs. You know that go-to-fail thingy with a duplicated line? I would, I will never know, but I would be willing to bet that was a merge of some complicated graph which didn't realize the, the lines had been moved, so it decided there was no conflict. It, there isn't. Hey, go to fail, go to fail is just, well, the first one is conditional, the second one isn't. Oops, so the conflict is there, but not actually. Keep your source code. Uh, my favorite source code control is a straight line with Okay, once in a while you need a detour and a merge. Anything more complicated gets scared. <laughs> Remember, good enough is good enough. I spent an hour last year convincing you of that. Uh, testing framework, I recommend unit test and all of its uh, uh, wonderful extensions, nose first of all. Doc test is great, but only for actually testing the examples in your docs. Don't make the same error I did and try to use it more. Extensively, I love test runners, so I don't, e I don't even have to explicitly run the test. They're running all the time as I modify the files, that's awesome. And I love continuous integration. BuildBot is what uh, the Python uses, but there are many others. Uh, mocks, remember, be very careful, use autospec. And then there are all sort of specialized testing, of which the only part I really know well is web apps. Uh, I'm sure there, there are plenty of tools for testing graphical user interfaces. I just haven't written one in 10 years, so I, uh, fuzzing means feeding random noise as input. It can discover bugs you'd never have thought of. Um, for web testing, you either simulate a browser that can be extremely fast because it all happens in memory. You're not actually uh, using uh, sockets and things. However, you won't get JavaScript, you won't get, so if you have big front-end stuff, that won't test it. will just test the, the core structure. The alternative, like with Selenium or WebTest, is to automate a real browser. That's slower, so that's 
probably what you want to have in integration and acceptance test. Each specific web framework tends to provide its help. So for App Engine, there's a test bed. That's, uh, yeah, we, we scrub out the comments so nobody knows, but I wrote that baby uh, originally. Uh, that simulates all the rich systems uh, that App Engine supplies. Uh, Django is even richer, so it, it offers a huge uh, test package. Linting, the static analysis, I recommend Logilab. It gets all the stuff you could imagine. For some people, depending on your environment, it may be slow, so uh, take a look at these two. They're, they're only good for one-tenth of the stuff, but they do run ten times faster, so if you want to be running all the time. Uh, there's many special tools. Clone Digger is kind of cool. It finds some duplicates, not every. De if, uh, depends on how close they are textually. But it's still worth running. It doesn't do false positives. Uh, question I promised to answer. Uh, when to use a bug tracker? And the answer is always. Uh, remember that it's not really just a bug tracker. You want to track both bug and features, and it's very important to be integrated with source code control and the code review tool, because when you're doing a code review, it's kind of nice to be like, okay, why does this change set exist? And that should be answered in, in a bug tracker entry and so forth. Worst kind of bugs are those that happen in uh, multi-tracking, so race condition, deadlocks, and so on. There is no way to test for those. Tests are no use, so you're almost without weapons. Yes, you can do some code reviews, but they don't help much either. So my solution is avoid concurrency based on sharing read-write memory. I know it's drastic, but it's really the only way. If you really, really must, in, uh, if you cannot possibly do it with message passing and shared read-only memory, uh, make sure you always have locks around and always acquire them in the same sequence as Jaistra told us, for example, with a dedicated memory changing thread. Test-driven development, and we're almost done in the last three minutes. Uh, again, it was invented by the same guy, see why I think this, especially, essentially, he wants people to prepare the test ideally in advance of coding, which is the uh, core idea. Of, and people don't realize the idea was current in the early 70s. You write the test, you make sure they fail, you fix the code so that they pass, you check they succeed, you make the code prettier, and they must still succeed. Is it worth using? Personal opinion, not for adding features. Because feature, the proper way to test features is not unit tests, it's acceptance tests. If anything, uh, use the next generation of TDD, which is behavior-driven development, that's focused on user stories, which is the right stuff. Only problem is the user stories should be written by a program manager or your users. If you have users and program managers that are uh, savvy enough, techy enough, to write the user stories, you are a lucky person, use this luck. Otherwise, well, maybe maybe uh, test-driven is not worth using. But for fixing bugs, then test-driven design is the only way to go. Because you know exactly what to unit test, the bug that you're going to fix. So instead of starting to fix, write the test that show the bug is there. Make sure they're all failing. This reproduces your bug in a known state under your perfect control. Then you fix the bug, and you run the test again, and now they all pass. And the new test stay in the test suite. And this is the way to avoid regression. Any bug I've ever fixed in any piece of code is tested for, just in case it tries to emerge again. And sometimes I catch it. But of course, it doesn't stay long because my tests are unit tests. They're fast. They're slow. They're lightweight. They're running all the time. And so the regressions can't survive long. OK, I don't think we have uh, any time for q and I'm sorry. I filled the whole hour with my blabbering. But I'll be around all day and all day tomorrow. So 
feel free to accost me with any questions I may have left. And thank you so much. The, uh, I have fixed both this English and the Italian equivalent uh, PDF. They, you can find them at the URLs on the respective presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex.